For those of you I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, I'm Jason Horn, a partner with GSV Ventures, and I'm so thrilled to be here today with Martin Basiri, co-founder and CEO of ApplyBoard. Martin, thanks so much for being here with us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're, we're, we're excited to have a conversation. ApplyBoard's mission is a bold one, to educate the world. I love that. And for those that don't know, ApplyBoard is an online platform for international students from all around the world to discover um, and apply to universities and colleges in the US, in Canada, UK, Australia. Martin, you may have added some countries to that. We'll, we'll get into all that very soon. Um, Martin, I've heard your story before. We've had the pleasure of meeting before at the GSP Summit in prior years and, and elsewhere. It's an amazing personal story. I was wondering if maybe you could start with that. Tell us the founding story of Apply Board. What need did you see in what markets? And really, what is the mission of Apply Board? Would, would be great. Yes, for sure. It came, as you said, from, uh, from my personal story. So I came to Canada for my master's degree. Uh, I came from Iran. And then after that, my brothers came for their undergraduate uh, studies. And the process was so hard. It took me more than like 18 months to figure it out, all the process. I came here and then I, um, you know, I started helping other people. And I, it was always a question, why is it so hard for the students? Uh, when I was here and helping other people, I started like going to the schools and I realized also it's very, very hard process for the universities and colleges. And that, that time we were like, like, how can something be so hard for the students and so hard for the colleges? So definitely the bridge or the application processing is, is broken. So we had this idea a couple of years later when like we learned English and um, got in like our paperwork together to be able to like be an entrepreneur. Uh, we decided to start uh, Apply Board in 2015. So we started with our mission, just like helping other people and and then and building something cool, you know, from our engineering background. And we started doing it. And for the first cohort of the students that we help, and they started coming and we realized the impact that we had on, uh, in their life. We just fell in love with the problem and with the mission of our company. And we were like, why don't we make it our life mission and try to like solve the problem for everyone in the world. And then we realized like majority of people, actually like almost 70% of people in the world don't have access to good quality higher education. And in the world that we are going through, like you need to like multiply multiple times in your lifetime get retrained because of technology disrupting the market so fast how can we accept that 70 percent of people from scratch they don't have access to any sort of a higher education and uh that's something that is, is it, that's something that day to day i'm thinking about it how can we help that many people like uh from all over the world a couple of hundred million people and yeah. uh, it's an exciting project yeah I, I love that martin and and as you've You've probably heard from us and, and maybe at the summit, which is it's really a core theme of ours at GSV, is that all people deserve equal access to participate in the future. That's really been a core theme across the event that we host here at the GSV summit and, and even across our investing. Um, and you, you, you clearly embody that, at, you know, at, at, as you mentioned, that, and you yourself, um, your background, it sounds like education has really transformed your life and, and um and that's amazing to hear. The other thing we, we talk about, um, we, we look for companies with what we call ROE, return on education. And a core piece of that is access. And again, Apply Board is a textbook example of a company that is increasing access. Could, could you just share with the audience quickly how many students you've helped since inception, how many you're, you're helping annually, where do they come from? Love to just get a sense for how big this market is, how, how big this could get. Yeah, so the... Uh, we help like so far since inception, which is the last seven years, uh, around 300,000 students, um, more than 300,000, which half of them is like last seven months alone, uh, because we are growing like uh, over 100% growth rate. So technically, like the, our entire history, um, we, we keep like every year, like uh, every year is as much as like entire history. And I hope we keep that growth rate because they're so the market is so big for helping the students. So we hope to grow faster so we can help more people. Um, the international students, as of the form that currently today exists, 
and we are not talking about the online ones and all the extra market that COVID and the pandemic created because of now someone in Nigeria can take classes from Arizona State University, for example. Right. Put that aside, the market is like somewhere between five to eight million people and growing like around like 10 to 12 percent per year, given the, the year. And but the real need for education. So if we say around half of the adult should go to university or college. So we are talking about about 350 million people that are outside of outside of colleges and universities today. Set aside that in a lot of developing countries, the population is growing very fast, especially in like Africa, in like India, uh, Bangladesh, those countries that actually like those are the countries that they have lower access to uh, higher education. So for example, like let's look at India alone, right? So yeah. India alone need another 45 million uh, seats for universities and colleges today for, for the demand of today. And um, that's like double, <laughs> that's like two and a half si times the size of United States, which is very, very mature market. So we can see like the scale of the problem. Amazing. So, so put if, if you know, help educate the audience a little bit for those that haven't spent a lot of time looking at international student mobility. I, I have in my career, my, my wife is an international student from Spain into the US. So I certainly have seen how, how difficult it is. And then the challenges continue, of course, when you graduate and, and look for work in a, in a whole bunch of ways. Um, put yourself in the shoes of maybe you uh, so many years ago or the, one of those Indian students you just you just mentioned. Could you talk about the frictions that international students face? You know, wh wh why apply board needs to exist? Yeah. So the biggest friction is like like it starts literally from like our country is like countries in the world is just completely different. And what is the um, return on education that is that's something that everyone is looking for is is defined differently in a country that for example growing very fast infrastructurally for example one degree like civil engineering might be very desirable for another country that is not growing that fast that might not be the best thing to study so yeah. the start of the friction is the unknown of information like if if we ask for example if you audience right now think about name five universities or colleges in Vietnam. You probably can't name any. Um, and so same as that Vietnamese students, if you ask them outside of like Stanford and Harvard and MIT, name five yeah. universities. They don't know. They don't know like, for example, the universities in different states that they can really like change their life. So that's one problem. The other yeah. problem is the one that I told you, what to study, you know? might be something that might be very good in their in their time at the time might not be as good for another country that they might want to go get their education and stay or go to a third country and the other thing is like a time wise like yes for example like you might study right now very good telecommunications growing your country uh for example for network but you know by the time you graduate or 10 years in your degree that, that need is kind of gone or the market is so saturated. So that's one is the market discovery. The second one is every university or college, they have their own assessment way of looking at the students. And when it comes to international students, it's all over the place. There's not, yeah. a, there's not an international kind of like a standard of saying Vietnamese GPA of 7.5 out of 10 is equal to this. Every university doing it differently. So students and their counselors spend tremendous amount of time figuring out whether they're even qualified or not. And the way that we, and then applying to different ones is different. Payment system is so hard, you know? Some schools like here, like easily like put a credit card, but it's not available in every system. Your credit card might not be international credit card. It's like very, very different. And their transcript, they want to see it certified, but certification different from is very different. So the way that we trying to solve it is like we say, what if we get all of these rules, a big data, we get all of these rules, try to standardize them, uh, structure them, putting it in the system. So you as a student, you don't need to know all these rules. You just come and say, I'm a Vietnamese student and my GPA is 7.2. And yeah. we can tell you whether this university for this degree uh, you have a chance of getting in or not. And then 
we provide you with like a local payment. We tell you like how to upload your document, when to upload it, where to doc upload it. And then we give you like a universal application system that literally you can apply to one school in Canada, one school in the UK, because you want to like try your chance of getting visa in both countries with one application. And we kind of streamline this process for you. It's amazing. It's amazing. There, there's so much, there's a lack of information, there's misinformation. So you're, you're helping them cut, cut through all that, which is amazing. And you, you, you alluded to it a little bit in there. There are frictions, not only with students and their families, but also faced by schools and, and recruiters, correct? They have their own sets of frictions, maybe, maybe around language, um, yeah, language proficiency of students, their ability to, to pay, the financial ability, I know is a big, is a big question, the quality of leads and apply boards helping reduce those frictions as well, correct? Yeah, like any other, um, like, like we're trying to like build the bridge from both sides because you gotta like help both sides, otherwise the, the bridge won't work. So on the school side, they wanna enrich their campuses with like good quality education, diverse from all over the world not only diverse by nationality and race, but also diverse by gender. For example, they want more women in their engineering school or like men in certain other programs. So they want to like keep their campus the best way because they know diversity is something that really like help them like uh, grow and yeah. flourish. And, um, but it's so hard. Like let's say you are a university in middle of Ohio. How can you uh, recruit the students from Vietnam? It's extremely expensive for you you just like get on a plane, go to Vietnam. You don't know, as you said, financial background of people, but that's yeah. like kind of the state of the market right now. So some trying to like overcome that problem by just partnering with some local par partners, but then how many countries you want to go and have the local partners. And for yeah. example, in a country like uh, Philippines is like 5,000 different highlands, <laughs> which one you are going to like have a, uh, have partner with, you know? Right. Like you want to like literally be everywhere or in China, there is 137, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 137 cities with population over 1 million people. So it, it, every university, then you need to like have a thousand recruiters to just like be able to like cover the world for getting the diversity. So you probably need more recruiter than even the seats that you have available for international students. So the way that we are solving it by university, just partner with us and we take care of that because Right. You need to have one partner in every single city, but we can have one partner represent like 50 university or 100 university. Right. Amazing. So you're, you're really supercharging their abilities to, to recruit students all over the world. If we could shift sort of um, more to the market today, uh, yeah, n n touch wood, we are um, seeing COVID loosen loosening its grip after after two years. What are you seeing broadly in terms of international student enrollment, international student mobility, as, as that is happening. Enrollments understandably declined, I guess, in 2020. In 21, they bounced back a little in the graduate space, less so in the undergraduate space. But hope, it seems like that's ticking up if you look at student visa issuances. What are you seeing? What, what trends are you seeing? You're, you're on the front lines, obviously. Yeah, for sure. So 2020 was terrible. Um, like a lot of hardship for both students and the universities happened. Uh, 2019 was the highest year for almost all countries except the United States that was on the verge of decline uh, because mm -hmm. of like, some of the immigration rule and the, the picture of United States globally at that time. Um, so what happened 2020 was a terrible year for students. It was a lot of hardship, borders were closed. So something like international education was like purely become online, which to yeah. some extent, was a gift for future because now the access to education is like broadened. Uh, but from the other side, like someone had to like, like a different time zone, right? So someone, for example, from Bangladesh should have stayed up to like 4 a.m. to start their classes in United States or Canada. 2021, we've seen some um, bounce back. Postgraduate, as you said, was higher. Uh, undergrad and K to 12, not that much. K to 12, almost like, and K to 12 and ELT, like when they come here to learn English, uh, yeah. that market is completely like, like completely almost like, um, it's still like uh, at a halt. Undergrad uh, kind of like um, came back. 
Now in 2022, I think for some countries like Canada, we're going to see even higher number of students compared to 2019. So not only they went back full recovery, they even like go to the growth mode. Uh, that probably happened for United States as well. Um, for UK as well, Australia, we doubt about it. But uh, we'll see like how they react in terms of like visas and openness for this July because there's uh, we have to like see what happened for that semester because the first semester wasn't as open uh, as they should. So probably they recover back in 2023 or not. But if I step one and looking at the, like a five year horizon, uh, this two year created a tremendous amount of um, demand for not only the backlog of students. But also mm-hmm. there were a lot of uh, students that, especially in the postgraduate, that before they do, didn't want to, to go a study abroad or didn't want to go to another country. They had a good job. They were staying. And the COVID didn't have a, like a same effect in everywhere's, everyone in the whole world economy. Or some people like recognize that being in certain countries, like for example, Canada, US, means they're going to get the first shot of vaccine or something. Different people have different core value systems. So we have added, um, like the vote added a new dimension of demand that before pandemic, they were, they did, they were not demand, but now they're created. Now they exist. Um, and this demand is far bigger than the demand that vanished because of uh, parents are, are like scared of sending their kids abroad or those things. Seems like, uh, by nature, the demand got bigger. So I think the next couple of years post pandemic, we're going to see like a huge uh, demand for uh, a study abroad. And, and how do you think COVID may have permanently changed this market? So in other words, as, as the pent up demand is met by supply, have, have students and families priorities shifted in these last two years? Are, are different countries, schools, degrees, programs, you know, emerging as winners or losers in, in your eyes over the next five years? Yeah. Um, so a couple of things that are like shifted very well. I think brand of countries like Canada, that they were like uh, Canada and United Kingdom, they were very easy with, uh, like they were like resonated more. They they also like offer international students, same thing that they were offering their domestic students. They help with the visa and stuff. I think those countries like permanently position themselves that we are a better country for talent. Uh, uh, so those, those are like from the countryside, those are definitely like the, the winner of the games. They, they really branded themselves very strongly by showing empathy to the talent. Because at the end of the story, these countries are just like fighting each other for talent, right? Uh, in yeah. terms of universities, we've seen, um, because of the hardship in application, uh, a lot of like, it was a, like a shift kind of to like a, I don't call it like a lower rank of school, but I mean, I, I'm saying like, uh, not as branded a school, let's call it like that way. And I don't think it's going to just jump back. So we've seen those, call it like those lesser known schools out of this abundance of traditional recruitment, they, they were able to step up. And now I don't think they're going to go down. So uh, definitely those are the winners of the market. People who use this time to show themselves digitally because when all this flying over and a student first went away, now the power was through Instagram and through like platform like Applyboard. And some schools really done a very good job and they won. And I don't think the market gonna like just shift back because the market just get open. So some of the schools that they were not as digitally savvy, I think they, we're gonna see like a lower bounce back for them at least for a couple of years um from the uh something that's completely changed uh, is um one the whole mentality of recruitment is changed that things should be digital no paperwork don't mail me transcript uh, that shift i don't think we're ever going to go back to the old system of like let's just ship each other like documents and stuff through dhl and take two weeks and the other thing that is like shift back is uh, before it was like a lot of problem with, oh, I got like more students for this semester. So students have to like now defer or, or do something because the schools were able to like teach online. They also built another muscle of open extra class. 
extra classroom. So uh, schools become like more flexible with with numbers up and down. And I think that's a muscle that stays and which is very good because a lot of students were going through hardship or a lot of schools uh, from the fear of over overbooking the number of students. They were on always like under booking them because they didn't want their calculation to, they were always getting a very conservative approach. That flexibility inside the schools, that change of mindset that we need to like be more flexible that stays and that's that that leads to a higher percentage of international student seats compared to the total size of the market. Amazing. You, you um, as you know, Martin, as a regular attendee, a, a number of presidents, provosts, chancellors will be at the GSP summit this year um, from all over the world. And, and, and of course, including the US, which it sounds like you, you believe has lost some ground here over the last couple of years from behind Canada and, and UK and, and elsewhere. What advice would you give to those individuals trying to recruit more international students for all the reasons you mentioned? What, what geographies should they be focused on in the short, medium, long term, maybe? Yeah, so I think the best advice I have for anyone want to enter, like think from the student side. Um, yeah. Days are past that we say, oh, because I am a school or I am this organization, everyone should adapt toward my thing. No, there are so many choices. Uh, people are less rank sensitive, very much less rank sensitive. So they're willing to go to like uh, a schools that are faster, better, more digitally, like digitally savvy. They're more flexible with timeline. They want to mm-hmm. do uh, partnerships. So things like co-op education is very, very, uh, is more exciting for students that they can, a school going to help them to find some job part-time to gain some experience in a country like Canada or U.S., then, for example, what's the necessary, just the rank of the university. So those things, like uh, I, I would like recommend them to, to think from the student side. It's definitely we are, we are entering a market of a student uh, market, not the university or colleges market. So students are the, the main seller, the main power. So they have to like change that mentality. Uh, in terms of like a market, we were very heavy on China, countries like Can- uh, so Canada, Yep. U.S. and uh, Australia and the uh, like the major four English-speaking countries, and we we've seen this shift from China to um, to um, India. So India is the next uh, market that is like, coming up very strong. And again, like some people are still like the mindset is still not as friendly with Indian students as, as with Chinese students. But definitely see that Indian number of Indian students overtake Chinese students in almost all the markets is already happened in Canada for a couple of years. We're going to see that very fast happen in other markets as well. China recovery is going to be very, very tough means um, means like Chinese students were the market that they were like less price sensitive. So that's why we've seen a lot of like Seventy thousand dollar MBA programs or sixty thousand dollar one year master's programs. I think those those programs are gonna have a hard time of recruiting. For example, for a country like from India, where the market is like more looking for prices between twenty to thirty thousand. So it's a good news and it's a bad news. It's a bad news if you wanna still like focus on seventy or eighty thousand dollar MBA programs. You're gonna like you're gonna like be more creative on attracting the students is a good news for the people that are in that price range or they can like bring a scholarship or fellowship or things that they bring the price lower. If in the previous world, they, they didn't have the rank to, to be appealing to Chinese students that they're like more rank sensitive. Now it's their time that they can grow. We've seen that in Canada, colleges that they, they, they're not even called universities, completely overtake universities in total number of international students um, which we don't even have like real ranking for colleges. For example, there's not U.S. Um, new system for colleges. So I see a huge opportunity for almost any university if they're willing to think from the student point of view and they match their prices correctly and they partner with the right people for international student recruitment that completely can win the uh, the bounce back. That's that's amazing. Well, if if they weren't Asking that question, it sounds like they should be huge opportunity over the next couple of years for those that that do the right strategic moves today. Uh, so that's 
That's incredible, Martin. Just moving, I guess, to the future a little bit. I'd love to hear your thoughts on um, that. That was the market today, when, and where, where we're headed. I, I'm struck as you're talking, Martin, that Apply Board is in an incredible position to build goodwill with students and families. You are there for them as they make the most important and likely the most expensive decision they have ever faced. Their families have ever faced, maybe ever. Today, as you've described it, Apply Board really is very much focused on reducing frictions around college and university discovery, matching them to appropriate institutions using your technology um, and algorithms, and, and of course the application process as, as well. And you described a number of other frictions for international students as well that, that exist, housing, financial access, insurance, language learning, uh, have you thought about how you might leverage all that goodwill to help students in other areas and, and address other points of friction? Yes, Jason, I'm, 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 I'm glad you asked this question. So our goal is to help every student because we want them to access education. And there are like a couple of big major problems. Uh, the, the, the biggest major problem is financial access. Like if even when we are talking about low price points multiplied by the number of years a student study, the minimum the minimum money one international students have should have set aside the PhD students and mass, some master's students that they get fellowship is like about fifty thousand dollar minimum you gotta have uh, for two or three years of your stu studies and your uh, living costs and this is like and this is a lot of money like it's ten times the GDP per capita of like a country like India so not everyone have this money. But talent exists in any form of um, families, right? Like for example, I came because of a scholarship. If, if, if Waterloo didn't give me a scholarship, I would have never been in Canada. So I never would be here where I am, right? My life completely be different. Uh, where we are so excited is like, how can we solve by end of this decade, the problem of money? So the poorest person, even the poorest person on planet Earth, if they're good students and they're qualified, we can like provide them the financial uh, access in what, whatever format that you're thinking about it right now uh, that they can study. So no longer my parents' wealth affects my future. So this way we can go and help the people who are kind of like don't have the financial mean and actually break the cycle of poverty because they can come and get educated and just change their their uh, their life and their family life, and they can break the cycle. Uh, it's a little ambitious to be able to say we're gonna solve all the problem globally by 2030, but at the same time, we know that companies do big things when they have ambitious goals. So we are going to do this uh, in the next. We have nine years to hit our goal um, to get there. That's very very exciting. Um, we, all, we already started like partnering uh, yesterday. It was actually a big announcement. We partnered with um, RBC Bank, which is like number one bank of Canada. So every student get like their guaranteed certificate program, their credit card, they, they check in account. So we started like working with the banks to learn about their privacy systems, about their internal systems, their APIs, and start like working with them to be able to like build our portfolio of banks that getting one step closer to our dream of providing also financial access. Also, we partnered with, uh, with uh, two of the biggest test companies, Pearson and ETS. And we started like providing, providing like even a cheaper version of their test. Um, I mean, like a, their test with some discounts to the students. So more students can just take their uh, standardized test, like a TOEFL and PTE, to be able to like try their chance of uh, of uh, trying to go study abroad, and that's like the other portion that I'm very excited that we started doing. Amazing, Martin. This was incredible. We started with your mission of educating the world and and the uh, appreciation that all people have equal access to participate in the future. So it seems like a, a great place to end as well as as Apply Board focuses on the next nine years, as as you said, and ensuring that people despite from, from, from any background, we'll have access to life-changing education. So let's, let's wrap there. Um, Martin, thank you again for this incredible conversation. So inspiring. Um, really appreciate the time and 
hope you and everyone listening enjoys the rest of the GSP Summit. Thank you very much for having me.